Hey guys, welcome to the show. This is Amy White with Daily Successful Living, and I am super happy that you guys decided to join me today, as always. And if you like what you hear, I'd love to have you as a sub- subscriber, if I can even talk today. Today, I have got a guest that I'm super excited to interview. I've been following her on YouTube for probably about a year or so, and she's got some awesome, awesome stuff on budgeting, getting out of debt, just organizing, which as you guys know, organizing, I always need help with that one. So I highly recommend following her on YouTube too. But anyway, joining us today is Kristen Stones with Sense and Purpose. And um, Kristen, welcome to the show. Thanks, Amy. I'm so happy to be here. Nice. Well, good. I'm glad to have you here. And I think if my memory is correct, this is your first podcast, right? This is my first podcast and I'm super nervous. (laughs) You do not need to be nervous at all. Hello, you do YouTube videos all the time and they are so good. So it makes me laugh that you're nervous. (laughs) I know. I know. Just something new. Yeah, I guess that's how it is. So, well, part of the reason that I had asked Kristen to join us is first off, she has a great debt free story. So, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, And then also, she's a huge budgeter, like really, really good at budgeting. And she's got a budgeting bundle that's phenomenal. So, I want to talk a little bit about that. And then also, um, she is like queen of side hustling. And so, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the mindset that comes and what you need to be doing if you want to kind of start that entrepreneurial vision. So, with that being said, um, Kristen, do you want to just kind of give us a quick introduction, maybe talk a little bit about your debt story, and then we can go from there? Okay, sure. So, um, I'll try to keep it brief. And our debt story actually starts um, probably about 15 years ago when my husband and I got married. And Um, Neither of us brought much debt to the marriage, just a couple hundred dollars on credit cards. Um, And we got engaged very quickly. Like I'm talking three months of dating quickly. And with that quick engagement, we gave ourselves a little bit longer time to plan the wedding. Um, And my husband started doing a lot of overtime. So he started doing a lot of overtime. I was home by myself and I felt like what happened is we tried to save everything we could for the wedding. So, so many of our expenses started getting put on credit cards and it wasn't too much at first, but over time compounded over time, we'd go through periods where we would pay them off every month for maybe a year or two. And then an emergency would come up and we'd fall behind. And then we'd run up a couple thousand dollars balance. Then we'd pay that off with the tax return. Then we'd start over. And this cycle just went on for, oh gosh, over a decade. So you guys were just habitual debt people. You would just kind of go through that cycle over and over again. I was impressed though that you paid it off periodically. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we did. I mean, we never liked having the debt, but we were definitely those people that thought we're always going to have two car payments. We're always going to have a mortgage. You know, there's nothing wrong with using credit cards, but it just gets out of hand so quickly. And we found ourselves just feeling like we were drowning. I wanted to be home with my kids. That's all I really ever wanted. And I had to keep going back to work because we had to keep digging ourselves out of this hole every few years. So uh, fast forward to just about two and a half years ago. And I think, you know, we were just at our breaking point. We had gotten a dog and she got really sick. We had to put a fence up, which was, you know, $1,000. She got really sick, which cost us over a mortgage payment to pay for her hospital bills. And it all had to go on a credit card. And I I just, I, I broke down. I couldn't take it anymore. And somehow I started looking around and I saw a church in our area that was offering financial peace. To our financial success too. Yes. It's awesome, awesome It's wonderful. It's such a great program. And, you know, I kind of went and asked my husband if he would be willing. And I really did not expect him to say yes. I really expected some pushback. And, you know, I truly believe that when you're in these types of situations, sometimes timing is a really important factor. So I had heard of Dave Ramsey before. I had actually used his debt snowball. I just looked it up online. I had used his debt snowball system to pay off my student loan debts a couple years before. And I was like, let's try this. And he, you know, he was hesitant, but he said yes. And we went and I mean, that's it. We were just so inspired, so motivated. Um, And we, as Dave says, we just went gazelle intense and we ended up paying off 55,000, just under $55,000 in just under 22 months. Changed our marriage, changed our life. Um, In there was actually a side business that we also had that we closed because when you go through that process of paying off such a large amount of debt and changing literally every part of the way you're living, 
it just changes you as a person. You know, we no longer were okay with debt. And this side business, even though it was supporting itself and paying the credit card bills with its own revenue, we weren't having to pay them out of our personal money. It just, we realized it was no longer serving us. We no longer could operate a business that was operating on debt. And we decided to close that entire business and absorb the la- another $20,000 worth of debt. And took, uh, you know, another eight or nine months to pay that off. And when we were done, that's it. We'll never, we'll never go back again. So my business now, I will not have any debt. You know, I only pay what I can pay in cash or I don't do it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And isn't it funny how life changing it is? I don't know about you, but once we paid off that debt, it's like there was just this huge weight lifted off my shoulders. I could just go through and I finally could just manage things. I mean, our debt payments were $4,200 a month when we got married. Oh, That's wow. a lot of money. Now wow. my debt payment is $1,200 a month on my mortgage. And I owe right around $100,000, you know, oh, and it just, you're almost there. I know we're so close. I really want to just pay off my house. We're so close, but you know, we got to put money in retirement and all that fun stuff too. So, yeah. so yeah. I know that one of the things from your blog that you attribute to your success was budgeting. And I'm a huge budgeter, but I think that you take budgeting to a completely different level than what I do. You are so on the ball and you guys, you have to check out her blogging or her, I can't even talk, her budget um, bundle it, on her website. I'll send a link to it, but it's phenomenal. But anyway, why don't you tell us a little bit about your budgeting process, what you found success with and kind of how you work a budget in your family in real life. Okay, sure. So um, I'm what I like to call a super nerd. I have a huge love for spreadsheets. Um, I handle all the finances in our relationship. Um, My husband was this guy who, when I met him, he would get his paycheck. He would go to the bank. He would put in the exact amount of money he needed to pay his bills that month. And he would take the rest in cash. And it was gone by the time the next paycheck came. So that that was serious. I'm dead serious. It was hysterical. I was like, what I can't even imagine doing? that. That is crazy. No offense to your like- husband, but that is so crazy to me. I can't even fathom that. Like that just is so weird to me. <laughs> it was it was kind of bizarre, but hey, it worked. He always put in like five dollars extra, so he always had enough in there. But yeah, you know, budgeting is something we definitely had to learn and practice, and it has just made such a huge difference. And you know. You get better over time, of course, but for us, I had tried to put us on a budget many, many times throughout the years. And what our budget looked like was, you know, and I'm sure some of your listeners will be able to relate to this and you might even be able to too. So you list out all of your expenses and then you list out, you know, your income for the month. And well, ours was completely upside down. You know, our expense column well outweighed our income column. And you think, what the hell? Oh, what the heck? Can I say hell? <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> okay. What the heck? How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to get through the month when we literally do not make enough money to cover our expenses? And let me tell you, Amy, we were not living. We have a normal house. We had normal cars. You know, we weren't out there driving luxury cars. I wasn't on shopping sprees, buying designer bags. I really didn't feel like we were living beyond our means. But the numbers obviously said differently. So a lot of times you don't even realize how out of whack your numbers are till you sit down and actually do it. I know that's us too. Cause we went through and I sat down, and I was like, how in the world are we spending this much money for groceries? Right. I'm like, what am I, what are we eating? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, I just threw out this and this and this. Cause it went bad. Like just a lot of little things like that. And it's such a eye-opening experience when you sit down and do that. So you sat down, we're like, whoa, we're in trouble. And then what, what was your next step? So, you know, every time that overwhelm would just wash over us and we'd try to make it work for a month or two and it would just fall by the wayside because it was just hard. It was so hard. So this time, you know, we, we knew what we had to do and it really wasn't quitting was not an option for us anymore. Or I think we probably would have found ourselves in, you know, our divorce attorney's office at some point. So, you know, this was it for us. It was do or die. And we sat down, we made it work. The number one thing was we had to stop using the credit cards because, you know, you use the credit cards to bridge that gap from the month until the next money comes in and then you pay that off, et cetera. So it's like that vicious cycle. And the problem is most people don't pay it off. You know, Correct. they'll use yeah. it as a bridge and then they end up over like $500 and then the next month it's a thousand and then it goes down to 500, but it always stays over and you can never quite catch up. 
It does. And that, and that's the danger, you know, credit cards themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. It's us and it's our poor habits and our poor man, money management skills to be able to stay on top of it. And that's exactly where we were. So, you know, like I said, it wasn't an option. We sat down and the first thing we did was we cut every single possible thing we could cut. You know, we cut cable and we cut the fluff and we cut, we didn't, we've never been one to go out to eat too much, but, you know, we cut those trips to Chipotle. We can't afford the guac, you know? So (laughs) it it was really just cutting out anything that was not a necessity at this point. And you just touched on it a minute ago, but one of the biggest expenses was food, just going to the grocery store. And you're right. Most people have no idea. So a great first step is to really take at least a couple weeks, better yet a month and track your expenses, every single thing you're spending, because most people have no idea. If you ask somebody, what do you think you spend on food a month? They probably say, oh, four or $500 when in reality, it's probably more like eight or $900. So it's very eye opening. And it really shows you where you can start to trim the fat and start making substantial changes that will impact those numbers. Yeah, I do definitely agree with that. You have to be able to know where your spending is before you can actually start cutting it. So at this point, you guys have gone through and you've, you've cut the basics, you know, like you said, you cut cable, you're like, okay, we're going to start doing I'm assuming you did a lot of meal planning based on some of the stuff I've seen on your website. Yes. And all. so once you did that initial, I know for us, we did our initial round and then like two or three months in, I was like, I can cut more. Did you guys end up doing the same thing? Yes, because you're so right. Because it, it becomes like addicting. It almost yes, becomes a game. like a game. Yes. Like a game. And you're, you're thinking, okay, I just cut that. And here's the thing. You see progress. So that progress you know, begets progress and it, it makes you want it more and more. So you're like, okay, what else can we do? What else can we do? How can we cut more? You know, how can we come up with more money? And you do. And, and I think, you know, you also become a little bit more willing because after that first round of cuts, you're like, oh, hey, I didn't die without cable. You know, I was actually okay. And believe it or not, you know, things start to get better and things start to feel better. And you start to feel that shift within your mindset and the stress level. And, you know, even though you still probably have a ton of debt, you can see that things are kind of taking a turn for the better. And you start to see that vision of where you can be and you start to believe that you can actually become debt free and it drives you. It really motivates you to just go hard. Yeah. No, I think you nailed it there because I th- we did the exact same thing. We did our initial cuts and I started seeing progress. I was like, honey, we can do this. Like this is doable. And then I took another look at the budget and I was like, hmm, I don't think we need this, this, and this. And I start cutting more and I start cutting more. And like you said, it really does. I'm so glad I'm not the only nerd because it did become a game for me. I was like, ooh, what can I save this month? And now that we're debt free, I don't do it as much. But you know what? There are times when I still go through and the, the habits that I gained from budgeting at that time period will never completely leave me. You know, like for example, clothing, stuff like that. I do not buy anywhere near as much clothing. I do not find myself, like I used to just go to Target and just kind of wander around and 50 bucks later, I'd go home and I'd be like, what did I buy? I don't do that anymore. I don't go to Target unless I have a shopping list. You know, and I think a big chunk of it is just making those conscious decisions, finding out where your your problem spending areas are and then going from there. So when you guys started, you know, you kind of hit your second, third round of budgeting, what would you say is like the like the one thing that everybody needs to do, like the most important um, tool that you use to budget? So I think for us personally, the most important budgeting tool, it's funny, I just posted about this on my Instagram yesterday. For us, it's been the cash envelope system. And I know a lot of people are really resistant to that. But for us, every time I think, okay, like you just said- Before you go into that, will you explain to everybody what the cash envelope system is? I think most people know, but just so there's a few in case, you know, just in case people don't understand that. Sure. So the cash envelope system is actually a way of using cash instead of credit cards, instead of any kind of credit, actually budgeting with cash and using actual cash. So the process behind it, and there's a whole bunch of different variations, but say, for example, you get paid on a Friday, you're going to take whatever money you need to use for your expenses out of the bank in actual cash. I know nobody knows what cash is anymore, (laughs) but you're going to take it out in actual cash and then you're going to fill 
physical envelopes that are appropriated for different categories. So for example, we have a, a grocery envelope, we have a clothing envelope, and we have an entertainment envelope, and we budget a specific amount of money for each of those categories. We put those actual dollars in that envelope, and that is the amount of money we have for that category for that pay period. Some people do it monthly, we do it per pay period, which is every two weeks for us. So the theory is if we have $200 in our grocery envelope, and we spend all $200 in that two week time period, well then we're SOL and we can't spend any more money on groceries until we're paid again and we fill that envelope again. Yeah, or you can pull money out of like your clothing budget. So say for example, you have $50 in your clothing budget, you're like, well, I'd rather eat than buy new clothes. Right. You may may adjust for that. But do you know what, you guys, we did the cash stuff for a while too. I don't do it now just because we're, you know, we've kind of gotten to that different point. But I got to tell you guys, as soon as I stopped using cash, I started spending more money. Right. It will save you so much money, especially when you're at the grocery store. Like I remember when I was in college and I was like living dirt poor and I was living on like envelope system without even realizing it. I could tell you within $5 how much money I was going to be spending at the grocery store. Like I kept track of it in my head as I bought all my groceries. I would weigh my produce. Like I knew what I was spending. I can go to the grocery store now and I will walk out of there and I won't have a clue what I spent, you know? And when you use cash, you pay so much more attention. And I got to tell you too, when, especially like with my clothing budget and stuff like that, when I was using cash, I did not like, I, I didn't want to give up that cash. I'm like, those pants are not that cute. <laughs> yes. If you're, ex- you know, that's exactly it. It makes you so much more intentional with every single purchase that you make because you think, you know, you have what Dave Ramsey says is using cash gives you a physical reaction. So you swipe your card, it's nothing. You're just swiping, you know, you see those American Express commercials where the lines flying quickly and everybody's just swiping or or visa check card whatever they are and the lines going so quickly, the people you don't even think. It doesn't even register you spent that money because there's no trend like actual money changing hands. But when you're taking that cash out of your envelope to buy that pair of pants, you're like, "Wait a minute." They're not that great. I might only wear these one time. They don't actually fit me that well. I want to keep that cash in my envelope for something better. You know, you don't want to settle for purchases that really aren't necessary. And I think that's why it helps curb spending so much more. Yeah. The other thing too, is if you don't have that envelope with you, you can't spend the money. So I remember when I was on the cash budget system, I went, um, I, I went to the, where did I go? I, I was going somewhere and Kohl's was, oh, I went to Sprouts because my neighborhood, there's the Sprouts. So I was grabbing some groceries and then there's a Kohl's right around the corner. And I walked over to the Kohl's and I was like, oh, I'm just going to buy myself something. And I mean, technically I had the money in the budget, but guess what? I didn't have my envelope with me. And so I remember going in there and I was like, oh crap, I can't actually spend the money. I don't have it. And so I went home and you know what? I bu- I did not buy something I didn't need because I didn't have the money. I mean, the envelope wow, now system. that's discipline. That is real, yeah. really discipline. <laughs> well, let's be honest. I didn't always make the right choice. I, <laughs> I tried. That was one of the times when I was like, ooh, yay, I'm so good. <laughs> but really, you guys, if you want to go through and be successful at budgeting, you really should start with the cash um, envelope system. It will change your world. And it will rock your world too, you guys, because you'll sit there and you'll be like, wow, I did not realize I was spending this type of money on this type of stuff. Like it just really, it, it really gets the pain, um, receptors going. Cause you notice oh, yeah. it, it's real money. <laughs> so yes, I agree. Yeah. I think I everybody should at least give it a try. It might not be for everybody because I know it's really inconvenient, but you know, like with anything else, if you try it and you give it some time, I think a lot of people, um, well, you'll get used to it and it'll just be your new normal. Mm -hmm. And you won't even think anything of it. So, and I can tell you guys just from personal experience, it worked for us. That is what got us out of debt in part was using the envelope system. It made a huge, huge difference. Now, and I did not use it for everything. Um, For example, gas. I'm sorry. I'm not going to go to the gas station every single time. It's just not worth it. (laughs) Girl, me neither. Uh -uh. Especially with kids. Or in the cold. No. Oh, yeah. See, we have to get here. 
I'm in Phoenix. So I'm like, Ooh, hundred degree weather. Oh yeah. Not dealing with it. You know? And so you have to do it judiciously. You, you need to kind of find, and you know, I think that's the point that I want to make with this whole budgeting discussion is you have to find what works for you. I mean, for example, what back then we were using the cash envelope system. We did zero based budgeting, which is where you pre-spend every dollar. Um, now that my budget is a little bit more free, I use a percentage based budget. So for example, for us, all of our needs, meaning like the, you know, like my, um, my insurance, my home mortgage, all that, we spend 50% of our income on that. And then I have 30% of my income on my wants. So that's kind of the extras. And for me, that actually includes like extra groceries. So I consider my needs, my basic groceries, but if I want to go through and have ribeye steaks one one night, then I consider that a want, not a need. So it comes out of that 30%. And then the 20% we do for retirement and savings and that type of stuff. And so how you budget, I don't think is necessarily important. I think there are budgeting systems that work better, but I think the most important thing is that you're budgeting, is that you're actually paying attention to your spending and that you know where your money is going and how much money you're putting on things. And then you touched on this just slightly, but you guys also went through and you cut costs. I mean, like you cut cable, you cut some of the different things. And I think that's a big thing too. I mean, I know for us, we cut eating out. We cut, we didn't actually have cable, so I didn't have to cut that one. But I did decrease like our cell phone plans and just all those little things. I also went through and I looked at all of our insurances. Yes, and, that's you know, contact. One. Yeah, that's a big one. There's a lot of little things that you can do to really um, save yourself some money. You know, it's just a matter there of- It really income. is. Yeah. It's just, like you said, it's just a matter of really taking the time and kind of audit all of your finances as a whole, every area of your finances. And I guarantee you, you will find savings. Like you said, especially with insurance. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Meal planning, things like that. I mean, there's so much to do. Um, I will go through and make sure and link to a couple of the budgeting um, posts that Kirsten has on her website. She's got some really good ones, including like some meal planning and maybe some of her YouTube videos as well. So let's kind of move on a little bit because one of the other reasons that I want, really want to talk to Kirsten is because she is huge entrepreneur and she loves the whole side hustle concept. And that was one of the big things that they were able to do is create extra revenue streams so that they could go through and make some of the changes they needed to financially. So why don't you share with us just a little bit about kind of like that entrepreneurial mindset and ways that you can go through and kind of start looking at the opportunities you have in your current life to maybe make a little bit of extra money. Okay. So for me personally, I have always had an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, I think when I was younger, I didn't really know what that was or what it was called. I just knew I felt a certain way and I just knew I always wanted to do something for myself. And I just knew that I hated working for other people. I was a good worker. I was, I always excelled at any job that I did, but I switched jobs often because I, I, I wouldn't like them. I just never could find something that I loved long-term. And I always swore that when I was little and I saw my father miserable and working three jobs, hating every single one, bringing that home each night, I always swore that I would never, ever live like that. So, you know, life is so short and we have so much opportunity. We live in such a unique time where you can literally earn money doing anything, oh anything gosh. So true. that you Right. Anything that you love, anything you have a passion for, anything you have an interest, any hobby, if you look hard enough, you can pretty much find a way to monetize anything. So this has been just such a struggle for me through our entire marriage. Everybody in my, uh, my stepfather's side of the family, every single person owns their own business. And when my mom married my stepdad, I thought, this is so crazy. Like, why do all these people own their own business? You know, I didn't realize there was an option pretty much other than going to work um, the same place for 30 years, working eight hour days. I just didn't know there was anything else. So, you know, when this whole world of entrepreneurship opened in front of my eyes, I was like, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. So I've tried it all. You know, I tried network marketing fail. Um, we tried um, selling on Amazon FBA, which was the business I was speaking of that put us $20,000 in debt fail. Um, I tried blogging a couple years ago fail, you know, and all of these, I made a little bit of money, but 
you know, I was kind of looking for this big win. I was kind of looking for, you know, the easy way to make a lot of money on the side and pay off this debt and become, you know, financially free, but there is just no easy way. So that's really what I, what I found. So when we were starting to pay off this debt, I, right before then I had said to my husband, I told you when we kind of reached that breaking point, I was home at that time with my kids and I was doing the network marketing thing and I was doing the Amazon FBA thing and I was just working hard, biding my time and thinking, okay, this is going to take some time, but it's really going to pay off. Well, it didn't pay off at all. It just, it was not a success. So I finally said to him one day, I have to get a job. That's it. And he was like, okay. And I looked online and I found a job pretty much the next day, went to work, Now, it was only part-time, but what it did is it allowed us, number one, to have the extra income to to really throw towards debt. So that made a huge difference in our timeline. And number two, since it was only part-time, it it really did allow me to kind of pursue other avenues. So for me, I was so inspired and feeling so empowered by this journey, and I felt so blessed. I felt like we had received so many blessings along the way of paying off this debt, literally felt like money was just falling into our laps, um, that I really just wanted to kind of pay it forward and try to share our story to help other people. So for me, entrepreneurship really started to look like starting another blog. So I did. I started a blog and I kind of dove headfirst into it. And a blog, as you know, it's really hard work. It's a lot of work. It's not just sitting here writing a few little articles online and playing on your phone, on Facebook. Uh, That's what people think blogging is. (laughs) They have such misconceptions, that and podcasting and YouTube and even Instagram influencers. They think it's such easy work. And I'm like, no, if you're trying to make some quick money, really, these are not the areas to go into it. There's much better ways to make quick money. You're so right. So, you know, I started that. And then along with that, I also tried the kind of selling the clothes online and, you know, really purging our house and selling things on fake Facebook marketplace. And, you know, you can make money, like I said, doing anything. And I think um, it's not necessarily entrepreneurship, just selling your old crap on Facebook marketplace, but it gives you a taste of how you can be at home and do things from your phone or from your living room and start making money. And I just, I wanted more and more and more. So that kind of led to my blog, which then led uh, to starting a YouTube channel. And that led to me kind of creating some of my own budgeting products, which I sell on Etsy. So, you know, I have all these different income streams and I'm not earning near what I want to be earning yet, but, you know, building that foundation and I'm home, I'm here, um, I'm working a lot of hours, but I'm accessible for my family. So that's that's what entrepreneurship means to me, really, is I'm, I'm here in my office 10, 10 hours a day, but I love it. I love it. And I'm building something for myself and for my family. Yeah, I think you nailed it right there. And I think that it's really important for um, our listeners to realize, too, that entrepreneurship, side hustles, it looks different for everybody. You know, I mean, for example, I've got friends that just go through and tutor. They, I've got friends that teach music on the side. All those things are a form of entrepreneurship, and they're a great way to go through and just bring in a little bit of extra income. And sometimes that extra income is all it takes to be able to stay at home with your kids or to be able to, you know, take a vacation or to buy the boat you want or something like that. And, you know, I think sometimes, um, particularly as women, we kind of we feel like we're channeled one way and we have to either be at home or we have to have a full-time job. And I, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't need to be that way. I mean, first off, I work part-time, very flexible schedule. And then I have my blog and my podcast and all that on the side. And do I make much money from it? No, no. I make like $500 a month right now from the blog and the podcast. But do you know what? Like you said, I'm building a foundation. And that foundation is something that two, three years down the road, when my daughter is full-time in school, all of a sudden I have something to run to rather than all of a sudden sitting there and going, wow, what am I going to do with all my free time? Not that I have much of it right now. (laughs) Right. But you're building that foundation that in a couple of years, when your time starts increasing, you can scale. I mean, you can now take, take what you've built and, you know, really scale it up and, and make a big difference in your bottom line. You're also able to help people, you know, and I think that's a big chunk of it too. At least for me, when I started my blog is I just wanted to be able to help people. I'm like, you know what? I've accomplished something pretty awesome. I want to help and share that with people. So I, I think what I'm, what I want people to understand, what I want the listeners to understand is that 
If you want to earn a little bit of extra money to help yourself get into a better financial situation, there are ways to do it. And I would say that the number one step is you need to sit down and look at your current skills. Sit down and like literally take 10, 15 minutes and just write, write, write and say, okay, this is what I love to do. This is what I'm good at. And then maybe ask some of your friends, see what they think you're skilled at. And the thing is, it's really, I mean, the sky is the limit. There are so many different things that you can go through and do. I love that point about asking your friends because, you know, we perceive ourselves how we feel others perceive us. It's something you probably heard. I think it's called Charles Cooley's looking glass theory. It's like we perceive ourselves how we feel others perceive us, but that's not the case. They always perceive us in such a different way. And it always cracks me up when people say, oh, you're really good at this. And I think, no, I'm not. That's not a skill of mine. But to them, they see me as being really skillful. And I think that's such a great idea if you're struggling and you maybe want to try and do something on your own, but you think you're not good at anything or you're not sure where to start. Um, I used to sell decorated sugar cookies and I never, it, it, I just started doing it because I thought it was fun to try. Well, people were like, can I buy those? And I said, what? And you know, it's something (laughs) I just kind of fell into, but people thought I was good at that. I didn't really think I was that great, but they were willing to pay a lot of money for cookies. So that's something I did for a while, earning some money on the side. And, you know, I love your idea about making a list because Building a business is really hard work. So even if you're not looking to build a business, but maybe you just want to earn some money on the side to pay off debt, if you can do that by doing something that you already love and you already enjoy, you're going to be able to put more time into it. Um, You're going to probably earn a lot more money because you're going to enjoy what you're doing. You're going to be more efficient. And nowadays with the apps and the websites, there are so many ways out there. And so many, you can shop for people, you can transcribe for, I mean, you can do anything. And it's, it's just such a great opportunity right now. Oh my gosh. I think you are so right. Like my niece, she was living with us for a couple of weeks in between a school semester and she just went through and um, delivered food for Poshmark. And I mean, she made a decent amount of money. I've got a nephew who goes through and um, drives for Uber. And then I've got one of my neighbors who literally just put a little thing up on Facebook. She's like, hey, I know it's Easter. Um, I'm selling cinnamon rolls. Uh, They were $20 for a dozen of them. Uh, Hello, I ordered two dozen because how awesome is that? But I mean, I don't know exactly what she made, but just based on the orders on there, she had to have made you know, a thousand dollars just for making a whole bunch of cinnamon rolls. Don't get me wrong. I have no desire to make cinnamon rolls. I think that's a form of torture. There are a lot of different things that you can do to earn a little bit of extra money. And none of these need to turn into a business. But if you are trying to get out of debt, one of the biggest and quickest ways to get out of debt is to increase your income. And if you can go through and do something on the side that's going to make you an extra $500 or an extra $1,000, all of a sudden think about what that does to get you out of debt. And think about what that will do in the future as you're trying to go through and pay for your kids' dance lessons or as you're trying to plan for retirement. I mean, like I'm a huge fan of retirement. And honestly, most of the money that I make from this blog, if it doesn't get you know recycled back in, I put that towards retirement. That's just my extra little money. And so I think a big chunk of it is just looking for opportunities and seeing what is out there. And, you know, you mentioned that you had a couple of unsuccessful ones. I actually had an unsuccessful um, eBay business. We lost $55,000 on that stupid business. Oh, you know, I mean, so I know it was horrible. Uh, I'll link to this. I'll link to that story too. I've got it. Of course I wrote it up on my blog. It was so bad. It was oh stupid, stupid, stupid. But anyway, yes, you can potentially lose money, but if you're starting out small And if you are really paying attention and not putting yourself into debt to do it, there's a lot of little things you can do. And then gradually, if it becomes something that you love, you can turn it into a business and it will help support you later. And I really think that when it comes down to it, that's what that's what we're all looking for is is flexibility and freedom. Absolutely. And just get out there and try something. I mean, maybe you won't like it. That's okay. There's so many other options options and opportunities. It doesn't matter if you don't like it. You can just try. It's not a job, you know, so you're not going through the hiring process and uh, being trained and taking this position and getting insurance. And, you know, it's just a side hustle. It's just earning some extra money. So if you don't like shopping for somebody or driving for Uber, try something else. And if you find something that you love, then yeah, it, it has the potential to really turn into something different. And, you know, I think, If somebody does have that interest in entrepreneurship, a really strong common thread between entrepreneurs is risk-taking. 
you know, so that that probably lends itself to me losing 20 grand on Amazon FBA and you losing 55,000 or on eBay because you're willing to take that risk and you're willing to fail. And yeah, it totally sucks to fail. Of course, nobody wants to fail, but now you know, you know, you take lessons from that failure and you can apply them towards your next venture or your next opportunity. And it it really does make make such an impact in your life and your business. Yeah. It's interesting. I was interviewing um, Cody Berman with um, Fly to Fly to Fi um, a couple of days ago, and he talked, you need to check out his po- his uh, uh, podcast interview because he talked extensively about that and how you have to get over your fear of failure if you want to be successful. Like you have to just take a chance. And you know what, you guys, I'm going to be blunt. You're probably going to lose some money here and there if you are trying to do an entrepreneur. You, let, let me not just say probably. You will yeah. at some point lose some money on an entrepreneurial venture. Yeah. And that's okay. You know, the main thing is that you go in there with your eyes wide open and you just do your best. Like I really, yeah, and fail, fail fast. I yeah. mean, fail fast, fail forward. And you know, that's eventually something's going to stick and you're going to find something where you have passion and you're, you're going to become successful. And, you know, with each failure, um, the faster you fail, the faster you're going to find that success. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I think you nailed it right there too. You know, and I, I actually I do want to highlight what she just said there, you guys, because I think that's really true. The faster you fail, the faster you're going to find your success. And so you have to take that like that step into the darkness and be like, okay, I'm going to give this a shot and do it. So what would you say is the number one thing that has made you successful financially? Honestly, budgeting. It really budgeting. has. Okay. It, it's, it's budgeting. It's uh, being really aware of what's coming in what's going out, where it's going, and just being mindful. Because the second you stop paying attention, you know, your money is just going to go away. It's going to go away and you're not going to know where it went. So really just being mindful, being intentional and paying attention to, to the numbers. You guys, I think she nailed it there. Because honestly, if you're paying attention to the numbers, that's when you do try and find that side hustle. That is when you do get yourself out of debt. That's when you actually control your spending. So Good advice there, you guys. You got to start budgeting. So Kirsten, where can everybody um, find you? Can you kind of give us some of your website information, your social media handles? Yes. So my website is senseandpurpose.com and that's spelled like dollars and cents, C-E-N-T-S. And that's all my social handles as well. So you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, everything is at Sense and Purpose. The only thing that's different is my YouTube channel, which is just my full name, Kristen Stones. Yeah. That's- and I highly recommend you follow her on um, on YouTube. She's got some great oh, stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime. Thank you. And her Instagram is really good too. She provides some really helpful stuff on there. So thank you for joining us today, Kristen. I really appreciate it. I hope you had a good time. And um, thanks again for joining us. Thank you guys for joining us. If you like what you hear, we would love to have you subscribe and uh, enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you.